from wading in the 9-11 memorial pools in New York City and removing dangerous rocks halfway up the Niagara Falls cliffs to sanitizing the train cars of Tokyo's renowned metro system, here's everything we deep cleaned in 2023. This is Jim. He's cleaning the reflecting pools at the 9-11 Memorial in New York City. Jim and his team are working beneath a 27-foot tall waterfall in near total darkness, vacuuming every inch of the pool. Their goal is to do it without missing a spot. It's a physically demanding job, but that's not the only challenge. I've never actually marked how many miles it is, but you do a few miles in there and it could be humid. It and you come out of there and uh, you feel like you walked on the moon almost. The pools are nearly an acre each, so it would take hours to finish the job before the sun comes up. While he works inside the pool, other crew members work on the bronze panels above ground. These routines happen five days a week and are essential for keeping the memorial in pristine condition for the millions who come to pay their respects here. They start by shutting off the waterfalls. And over the next eight hours, Jim and his team work tirelessly to deep clean this pool. The hardest part is, it's, it's a long test. The pool is big. It's, it's not a, uh, a swimming pool. You know, it's a 200 by 200 giant pool. I'm gonna pull the hose out and then bring it back. Or whatever. Just, you don't have to use the whole reel. We got too much hose. We usually have three men through the pool, so two guys be in the pool, and one guy will be outside running the, the pumps, which collect the uh, debris and return the clean water back to the pool. Once we're set, we're on our way. I go and vacuum, generally, and I, I have whoever's with me that night, brushes behind. Come on, hurry up. We don't got all day here. Yeah? <laughs> right. The vacuum will capture most of the debris and the person brushing will knock up some of the other loose debris that doesn't get caught and it will be caught into like some of our filters that we have running downstairs. Now I'm, I'm trapped in the hose here. I'm gonna trip myself. And we'll be on America's bloopers. <laughs> The workers generally clean out dirt, leaves, and algae from the bottom of the pools. They also remove larger items that visitors drop or throw in. They don't always know what they'll encounter in the pool each night. We find kids toys, little small items, depends on the, the crowd. One night, I actually found a, a bat in there. And I'm not talking about a baseball bat, I'm talking about a bat. It was pretty wild when it flew away from me when and I realized I was grabbing a bat. Depending on the cleanliness of the pool, it could take anywhere between six and seven hours. And sometimes if we feel up to it, we could do it a little quicker. Some people treat this place like a uh, wishing well, so we do catch some money. And unfortunately, I think some people, being that it's so far removed, from the original 9-11. I think some people are a little uh, uneducated about this place and some people treat it like it's just a regular fountain and they're throwing garbage in here sometimes too. You know, people have to learn that this isn't your uh, mall fountain. I knew a few of the uh, brokers that passed away. A whole, uh, a whole group of them had a meeting in one of the towers, unfortunately, and uh, except for one, one trader, all of them perished. I, I think about them often because we go up top where the names are and brush near the nameplates, the troughs, and uh, on the north side, they're all, all on one panel. So I see, I see their names just about every day. Total waste of uh, lives that you know, could have been doing good, good in the world now. While Jim and the team finish cleaning the pools below, Ryan is tackling the bronze name panels above. The panels honor the 2,983 victims of the attacks on the World Trade Center, both in 1993 and 2001. 
Ryan will have to strip the top layer of metal and use a blowtorch to remove a carving someone etched onto the plaque without damaging the rest of the memorial. This confuses me why you'd want to write something here. For a mark like that, you have to go pretty deep, get all the way down. Otherwise, you can't really get rid of it. If you don't go down far enough, you'll see it when you refinish it. The further down you go, the better. Sometimes I've seen nice things written, but you know, you, you, they don't understand. You just, you can't just write whatever you want on it. After briefly assessing the damage, Ryan needs to remove the protective bars so he can reach the entire metal surface. To do this, he props up the bars with a wood plank and unhooks the brackets holding up the panels. Whew. Now what I'll do is uh, rub it down with the NAFTA. It's almost like a paint thinner. It just kind of takes the wax off so I'm not burning wax. <sighs> if I can open it. <laughs> and it shouldn't take too long once I get the torch on it. There's so much in the prep and then the finishing, the torch is actually not that bad. After sanding down the top layer of panel and neutralizing the wax, Ryan is ready to blowtorch the damaged area to melt the metal in the patina so he can repaint the color layer and restore the panel to its original state. This is what we use. And it's basically just a patina in a solution. Oh, I haven't used you in a while. Prep them. So I'm basically getting up to the right temperature. If it's too cold, it, it'll go on spotty. If it's too hot, it'll kind of evaporate off or it'll get burnt. In the summer months, the longest part of the job is waiting for the burned panel to cool before applying a new layer of wax and an acrylic top coat to finish the restoration process. We're gonna put the acrylic spray on it. Just kind of like a clear coat helps it kind of adhere a little bit better. The last step really, well, besides buffing the wax off. So I'm just gonna put the wax on real nice, not too hard, not a lot, you don't need a ton. And just put it on lightly. The wax will go over the finish and make it look, once I polish it, it'll look brand new. I've got a little bit of heat, but that's because it's still hot. but it was right here. Now all Ryan has to do is buff off the excess wax using a white Scotch-Brite pad. And then once it gets smooth, you know you're done. When people do something like that, I wouldn't say it makes me angry. I get it. Some of these people might not have even been alive when it happened or they were too young to get it. My uncle was a New York City firefighter and he was hurt really bad here, but uh, luckily he survived. We got, we got a little lucky. After a strenuous six to seven hours of cleaning, Jim and the team are ready to head out of the pool. By tomorrow morning, a new batch of visitors will see sparkling pools below rushing waterfalls. And most of them won't know that Jim's team was even here. When we uh, finish the pool, most of the time we just, we're just ready to really get out of there. and. Most of our inspection, we, you know, we're fairly confident that we did the proper job. There's always a little fail factor, but, you know, not too bad. My father worked in these buildings almost his whole life. And my father was here for uh, the 93 bombing. And that was before cell phones and everything. And he was, the, he was on the 30th floor of the uh, second tower. When he was there, he was like the floor marshal. He came home full of soot, but he stayed there because there was people that couldn't get down the steps. So he made sure that he stayed with them. So I, I think on 9-11 day, you know, if he was here, uh, we probably would have lost him because he wouldn't have left. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was always so proud of, of the job. I, I probably had chances to do other things in this building, but even if I wanted to do another job, I wouldn't because of him. And, I, and now, you know, I, I love doing it, so I do it. 
Next up, we travel to Japan to see how the Tokyo Metro keeps its reputation as one of the cleanest transportation systems in the world. This is Takayuki, a cleaning supervisor at the rail yard in Ayase. He's worked for Tokyo Metro for almost 41 years, and it's his job to make sure the trains are cleaned thoroughly. The Tokyo Metro system is famous for being one of the cleanest subway systems in the world. It transports an average of about 6 million people daily, and maintaining that reputation takes both an extensive amount of operational organization and a ton of manpower. The cleaning staff's approach is straightforward, but uncompromising. Whatever Tokyo Metro's millions of daily passengers touch must be cleaned. Today, they're cleaning the train cars at the ISA rail yard, which they do every 15 days. The cleaners take careful measures to ensure each nook and cranny is cleaned. Then, we'll head to the Ginzai Chome station, located in one of the busiest shopping areas in Tokyo, Japan, where they clean the station top to bottom. There are 41 trains on the Tokyo Metro Chiyoda line. The team cleans three to four trains a day. Once a train comes into the rail yard, cleaners start by picking up any trash they see. It takes four workers to clean the exterior. It's all done by hand, and cleaners start by hosing it down with water and then using brushes to scrub it with soap. え、ま、if the stain does not come off with a brush and soap, then they use a pad to scrub it off. Next, they rinse off all the soap. Meanwhile, other staffers clean the interior. It takes 10 workers, and they start at the top of the car and work their way down to the bottom. The first step is to clean the area where advertisements are placed. Then they clean the luggage racks and then the wall area. They use rags and dusters to clean each part. はい、あの、シートの清掃がありますので、シートの清掃については家庭でやれます。この放棄を使って、このように汚れをホコリを落としていきます。Cleaners then tackle the floors and start by mopping. They also use sticks to clean crevices near the entrance of each door. Twice a year, they wax the floors of each train car. They remove all the old wax with a polisher and then they let it dry. Once it's dry, they apply two coats of wax. It takes about an hour and a half from the time the wax is removed to the time the new wax dries. Altogether, it takes workers a little over an hour to clean the trains, inside and out. Once the cleaning is complete, Takayuki begins his inspection. あの、工具の置き忘れだとか、突き残しですとか、ゴミの取り忘れがないので、え、いい状態だと思います。15日過ぎるとやっぱり車内の方もあの、汚れっていうのが出てきますね。綺麗になってますね。はい。やっぱり
、えー、清掃の人数もかけてますし、えー、お金の費用の方もあのかけておりますので、まあ、やっぱりあの社内についてもやっぱりそれなりに綺麗な状態を維持できていると、えー、思ってますので。Once Takayuki approves the cleaning, the trains return to service, ready to transport millions of passengers all over again. Inside the Ginza Ichome station, Chikako and Kenji work to clean the station daily. そうですね、この辺はやはり銀座の駅が近くにありまして、えー、乗り換えの駅にもなっておりますのでお客様の、えー、流通はかなり多くあります。カズイロ has been working for Tokyo Metro since he was 18. He got his train license at 20 and drove trains until he was 57. He leads the team responsible for the cleaning and security for this station and a few others. There are nine Tokyo Metro train lines and 180 stations that provide service to the Greater Tokyo area. Metro Service is a Tokyo Metro company. The Metro Service is a Tokyo Metro company. The Metro Service is a Tokyo Metro company. 日比谷線の銀座駅、万能線の銀座駅を担当しております。The escalator handrails are a high-touch surface within the station, and Chicago takes extra care to wipe the belt with wet washcloths. She rides the escalators up and down until they are all clean. エスカレーター注意するときは、あのー、なるべくお客様の中に混じって掃除しないとか、あのー。インレットに足をつけたり、物を落としたりして、エレベーター、エスカレーターを止めないようにします。気をつけます。つけてます。えっ、ー、とエスカレーターの長さにもよるんですけども、短いところでしたら10分以内では済むと思います。チカコ is also responsible for the dirtiest job of the day, cleaning the two restrooms in the Ginzai Chome Station. The main cleanings happen once a day. She has been doing this work for the past 10 years. The first thing Chikako does is check for any large pieces of trash. If there are none, she sets up a fan and leaves it on throughout the cleaning process. Efficiency is one of the key parts of her job, and the fan allows the bathroom to dry quickly so as not to disrupt any customers who may need to use it. あの常にあの使うようにしてます。どうしても匂いが出てきてしまうので、これを使いますね。今日はとてもいい例でした。なんかいつもと違いますね。チカコ sticks the ozone machine hose down the toilet and turns it on. Then she scrubs each toilet by hand to make sure it's clean for the next customer. She also cleans the walls. It's important that she's using the right tools for each space so as not to cross contaminate areas. She uses a red dust cloth to clean areas from the knees down, which is called the contamination zone, and a green one for clean zones, which are areas above the knees, such as mirrors and sinks. So, you can see it clean. 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 ここ3年ほどコロナがありまして清掃の人員が少なくなってしまった時にはやはり匂いですとか汚れがかなり強く出てましてお客様からもご意見が出ておりました、えー、駅のトイレを利用したお客様がやはり綺麗で、えー、使いやすいと思うと
結局リピーターになっていただけるのかなと思いましてそれがメトロの中でお客様の需要が増えるというようなことになると思いますので綺麗なトイレを目指しております。Chikako is also responsible for cleaning the barrier between the platform and the train doors. The top part is cleaned daily, while the lower part is cleaned once a week. The staff makes sure the station platforms and walkways are clean for customers. They do cleanings with brooms every day, but they also use a machine to clean the floors twice a month. The machine works by sprinkling water onto the floor, scrubbing with a brush, and then collecting the dirty water with a squeegee. This way, there is no water left behind and no slippery floors. Kenji also goes around daily with a shoulder vacuum and manually vacuums up any trash and dust he comes across, especially in hard to reach areas. Japan has a long history with cleaning and cleanliness that persists today. The cleaning is not a good thing. The cleaning is not a good thing. The cleaning is not a good 電車から離れて人とぶつからないように壁側に立つように基本しております。この会社はですね、結構、えー、年配の方が多いんですね。なので自分とも同じ年代の方と一緒に、えー、駅の清掃をしてですね、それをお客様からお褒めをいただい,い,ただいたりするとすごくやりがいを感じるところでございます。えー、東京メトロのグループ理念で。東京を走らせる力というのがありまして、最終的には快適に利用していただくためにきれいにしているというところでございます。This is Rivers. He's wading through a pool of waste beneath one of the largest aquariums in the world, Georgia Aquarium. It's a filthy job, but that's not the only challenge. There's a lot of waste to manage. When this basin is full, it can hold between 5 to 10,000 gallons of poop that funnels here from the aquarium's habitats. And it's the culmination of many routine cleaning procedures that happen at the aquarium each week, without which the safety and health of the animals would be at risk. By the time Rivers and his team's work here is complete, the wastewater from this basin will be cleaned, filtered, and reused as top off water. For the aquarium's largest exhibit, Ocean Voyager, and the cleaning cycle will begin again. But before Rivers can do his job, several other critical procedures have to happen first. Every day, specialized teams gear up to clean the hundreds of exhibits at the aquarium. One of the first you'll see when you enter the aquarium is the sea lion exhibit, which is home to this guy, Toby, a 279 pound harbor seal. Before a team of divers can begin cleaning his habitat, Toby and the other sea lions need to vacate their pools. Staffers use this time to do their weekly weigh ins. And if we're talking about dirty jobs, he just urinated on the scale and now we gotta clean it. Side effect of the job. This pool, it's all sea lion poop. It's all sea lion poop. Everything that she's vacuuming from here is going into that waste basin. So, whatever we do in here, the LSS or life support team then has to clean up from their end. Megan Wade leads the Pinnipeds team to clean the decks and assist the dive operations team as they clean the pools before guests arrive. This space is home to 14 sea lions and three harbor seals. The sea lions can eat 5% to 8% of their body weight, making the sea lion exhibit one of the dirtiest in the aquarium. Every single morning, we come in first thing and prepare their food. And this is restaurant quality fish. So they get numerous species of fish, about five different species. And every single morning, one or two people will come in and inspect every single fish. So we're looking for missing eyes, missing fins, gills, scrapes, 
cuts, anywhere where you're gonna see that can breed bacteria. So that fish automatically gets sorted out and we don't use it at all. We weigh out their food into buckets and then we'll look at it again one last time before feeding it to the animals. Once a week, every Wednesday, it's Way Day Wednesday. Follow me this way. We have our blue scale right here and then where the green is lit up is gonna tell us how much they weigh. So each sea lion will walk from their habitat down this hallway, we'll get their weight and then they'll walk back to their habitat. After the sea lions are fed, weighed and out of the main spaces, Megan and the team start working on cleaning the deck areas. Her team splits up between the back pools and the main gallery where they detail every nook and cranny. As soon as you come in in the morning, you can usually smell uh, that they have been sleeping overnight. We have high up platforms that they like to sleep on, the rocks, and when you're sleeping and you don't get up to go to the bathroom, it all just sits there. So if we didn't clean every single day, it would be really stinky, kind of an ammonia smell. Also, there's fecal matter as well. We are going to detail this whole area. It gets cleaned every single day, but we detail it once a week, every week. Three male sea lions and one male harbor seal all slept out here last night, so it's probably gonna be pretty messy. The chemicals that we use are to really break up that oil that's on the surface that the sea lions secrete. So it's just soap and water, and then we'll use some chlorhexidine to disinfect the area afterwards. And then down here, Gail has a, like a nice little hand brush and she's actually doing one of the dirtiest jobs. She's cleaning the drains. All of this is gonna always be hosed to a drain away from the water the sea lions swim in. She's taking the grates off, cleaning inside the drain so that everything flows nicely each day that we clean. So the drains are part of the detailing. The removal of the net and soaking, that's part of the detailing. Sea lions, when they breathe, sometimes shoot snot out of their nose. So a lot of times in sea lion habitats, you'll see brown snot on the walls. So we'll need to scrub that off too. My favorite part about cleaning the deck is getting to net the poop out of the water because I, it just so reinforcing when you do a good job and you get good at it. So I just love doing it. After Megan and the Pinnipeds team work on the main gallery deck, Alex Glick and a team of divers work on everything below deck at the sea lion exhibit. Today you're going to start in pool two and then do pool three. This one's vacuuming and uh, floor scrubbing and then pool three will be vacuuming, rock work and then a final floor scrub. So we do this dive on uh, just normal scuba, even though it's uh, only an eight foot pool. We still do scuba diving so that you have freedom of movement. This is our vacuum hose. They actually plug this in in the water and we have to make a radio call to our life support system and they'll turn the vacuum on. So we drop the vacuum head in the water with the hose attached to the diver. And then they will prime the hose to get all of the air out of the line. This pool, it's all sea lion poop. You want to get as much vacuumed up before you start scrubbing the floor. This scrubber is one of the key tools the divers use to thoroughly clean everything under the water. A hose pumps water through the engine, which powers the scrubber. This high-pressure water makes cleaning the floors and walls much easier. The single scrubber has hard bristles and is used for rock work, while the double brush scrubber is used to clean the walls and painted surfaces. Once she's done vacuuming, I'll give this to her and she will then clean the floor. And she's holding the trigger down and she's just swimming back and forth doing kind of like a lawnmower motion, cleaning one side to the next to get every single inch of the pool. If she comes across an area that's particularly dirty, she might slow down and spend a little time on it to get up whatever scum is on the bottom and then move on. Animal debris doesn't just settle on the habitat's floors and surfaces. It also collects in grates and skimmer boxes. These outflows help manage waste between routine cleanings by separating animals from some of the debris. In total, it takes Alex and his team of divers roughly an hour to complete their work in both pools. On the other side of the aquarium is Ocean Voyager, the largest indoor aquatic exhibit in the United States. It holds 6.3 million gallons of water and is home to whale sharks, manta rays, 
and thousands of other fish. This space is largely dependent on an advanced life support and filtration system, but still relies on teams for maintenance and hands-on cleaning. In Ocean Voyager, we have two whale sharks. There's Yushan, which is the larger whale shark, and then there's Taroko. Common misconception about whale sharks would be that they're dangerous. The most intimidating thing is they're just big. They just are big, and so like if you're in the way, you just gotta move. They are not out to hurt you. Like, their throat is only a, the size of a quarter. They're very, very docile creatures, and they just wanna cruise along. We usually have four to eight divers in our everyday maintenance dive. We clean the windows, so we need our suction cup. We bring what we call a diaper, otherwise it just looks like a rag. When we clean the acrylic windows with that, and then usually we're doing hand scrubbing. They are scrubbing off the algae, and they're kind of basically wafting off all that sand substrate that cakes on and falls over onto those rocks. All that stuff that can grow on there is potentially harmful for all the fish. So the whole goal of cleaning and upkeeping the exhibit isn't necessarily to keep it pretty, even though that is also very beneficial to keep it pretty for the guests, but at the same time, there is the purpose of doing it for the health of the exhibit. This is a monster exhibit, so if we didn't do it every day, it'd be pretty much impossible to upkeep. The blitz dives, which are our night dives, that's our essential deep clean. So it can be a couple hours long just to get everything we can done. We can run up to four of those Armada machines and clean different areas of the exhibit. While Ocean Voyager is being cleaned, Carolyn Murphy and the Aquarist team are over at the River Scout Gallery getting ready to dive into these three freshwater tanks. The smallest tanks measure four feet tall by three feet deep, and the team spends one to two hours every week cleaning the windows and maintaining the underwater gardens here. So despite the size of these tanks, we actually do manage to squeeze some people in there. What we are gonna be doing is something called hookah diving. So the divers are getting in very carefully. So they're kind of sliding in the top of the tank and they're gonna be holding themselves up in the water column by pressing their feet to opposite sides of the tank or putting them on the outside, the top rim. And they'll kind of hold themselves with their core strength kind of up in the water column to do the work they need to do. We're focusing on the algae that's growing on the window and the plant leaves, and then also the detritus that's building up in the tanks, and that can be fecals from fish or leftover food. The team goes into the dive with a few core tools, a scrub brush, trimming tools, and a fine plastic scraper to clean algae off the windows. The most painstaking part for the aquarists in this tank is cleaning out the beard algae. So it is so annoying and it is something that we tediously tried to keep under control. So you're seeing these little kind of black puffs and that's what she's targeting right now when she's scraping it off and immediately removing it from the system because it will just spread over everything. The divers use a gravity siphon to clean out the loose debris that's settled in the gravel. This isn't powered by electricity. It relies solely on gravity to suction up and separate the waste from the gravel. Algae covering everything doesn't look great, but it also can cause problems for your fish. So algae blooms in the wild can kind of take the oxygen that the fish need out of the system, so it can cause them some harm for them that way. All the waste and debris from each of these cleanings ends up here. This is cleaned out every three to four months to ensure the basin doesn't overflow, it doesn't create water quality issues, and all the systems continue to run smoothly. As you can see, we've got just piles of poop and debris and extra food, stuff that didn't get digested properly, stuff that didn't get eaten, got pulled into filtration. Most of it is just animal waste. There is a little bit of sand, probably about 10 five gallon buckets or so. The equipment we'll use to clean the basin is a fire hose and a snow shovel. Cleaning this space takes roughly two to three hours and is done in stages. They'll remove the poop, clean the floors, and then shovel all the sand out. Once we've gotten the sand out, then we'll go around and inspect the walls, make sure there's no cracks, make sure the waterproofing is still good. So where all the discoloration happens is about where the basin gets. Roughly 55 to 60,000 gallons to a full basin. 
But other than being gross, the hardest part is definitely getting the sand out, just because we got to lift it 25 feet in the air. So we really only want to fill them about half full. Um, if they were to get too full, they might splash, and they're also just really heavy. Once this basin is full, we will then recirculate all this water and clean this water to reuse it for top-off water for our Ocean Voyager exhibit. After the recovery, all this water is crystal clean. Next, we head to Niagara Falls, where special teams show us how they remove dangerous rocks and maintain the trails for visitors' safety. This jagged sheet of rock is hanging 200 feet above a walking trail next to the Niagara River. It's already loose, and if it falls, it could mean serious injury to hikers on the path below. That's where the rope access team comes in. If they do their job just right, most of Niagara Falls' 9 million yearly visitors will never even know they were here. First jump of the day. Am I scared? Yeah. Am I scared? I have a healthy respect, that's all. This cliff is located at Devil's Hole State Park, roughly four miles north of Niagara Falls. Team members like Andy and Christian will scale the cliff and maintain the crew's gear. Later, Jake will clear dislodged rocks from the trail. If those rocks were to fall naturally, there's nothing stopping them from coming and just plowing through somebody that's on the trail. So very necessary work what we do here. And you can see here all the rocks that come down there are pretty sizable and they could cause some damage. It's a dangerous job. Dehydration, injury, and inclement weather are just some of the risks. Thunderstorms are forecast today, so the team is on high alert for signs of lightning, which would endanger the crew. We won't work in lightning, that's about it. We're gonna have fun. You know, usually when we show this to people, they say they didn't even know this existed. There are 12 members of today's crew, four supervisors, including Andy, and eight technicians. Today, their goal is to clear this entire section of the cliff. Their day begins at 7 a.m. at the maintenance shop where the team packs a variety of gear into vehicles to take it to the access point above the trail. See, the fun thing about this is that I don't actually jump with them every day. So today will be uh, one of the days I jump with them, which is good because I've been wanting to do this for a while. These are the guys who, who do it every single day and they're really, really good at it. After a short 10-minute drive, the team arrives at the access point and begins gearing up. I guess we can start with the piece de resistance. This is our climbing harness. It's a class three harness, um, and it's called that because of the shoulder straps. The shoulder straps prevent climbers from slipping out of the harness if they accidentally turn upside down, and the seat balances their body weight so that blood flow to their legs isn't restricted. Comfort is also of the utmost importance, as climbers can be suspended for more than two hours at a time. This device here is our bar rack. This is what we use to repel. It's a pretty old school device. We have a lot of mud and, and grit, and when the ropes get wet, they swell. So there's not a lot of moving parts. It's all friction. So that's our descent device. All right. Pretty much all ready to go here. No one cares about me. Everyone says, Andy, just take care of yourself. <laughs> so what they're talking about is some, some guys have a, uh, a rope handler watching their line, and then some of us are on what we call an ASAP, which is this. This is your backup device. And so I'm just fully in control of all of my, my, my descent. So I can actually step over the edge now. First jump of the day. Am I scared? Yeah. Am I scared? I have a healthy respect. That's all. The crew's really close. You know, we joke around a lot, but when it is time to actually go over the edge and do work, you know, we kind of call that game time because it is, you know, you need to take it seriously because there's a lot of risks involved. This program that we're part of has been going on since about the 1930s and about the whole time they've been using pike poles. There's a lot of utility with this. This is made out of solid fiberglass here. So if it gets into the, the cliff, this can flex a lot. Um, you can use this to position yourself on the wall and then you can use this to 
you know, gently remove debris. You know, you can grab stuff with the hook, gently pull it out. It can fit into cracks, and then you can get leverage that way. One of the things that makes removing these rocks especially challenging is that these cliffs undergo something called differential erosion, which means that areas of the cliff erode at different rates. Layers of shale rock located lower on the cliffside wear away more quickly than the layer of dolomite rock at the top. That leaves large, unstable chunks of rock, sometimes the size of an SUV, hanging at the cliff's edge. The crew uses a controlled swing to gain access to material beneath overhangs. To do this, they push themselves away from the wall with their feet to maintain that controlled movement. These are softball shin pads, and they work really, really well for what we do. You try not to knee the wall, but sometimes for stability purposes, you know, you, you can't really help it. We all try to wear steel toe or some sort of composite toe. The rocks are hard. You know, you can't always dodge a rock when you're moving, so, you know, having something like that to keep yourself safe is 100% is necessary. It's 10 a.m. The crew is only about two-thirds of the way through their climb when the one thing they're worried about happens, a storm. Copy. Looks like we might have a wall of rain. Yeah, I'm going to head back. Let's head back. The crew hears thunder and spots lightning as they are on the cliffside. They need to stop working immediately. That will end their progress for today. So today we actually had to cut short. We have metal pipe poles in our hand. We've got a lot of metal gear on us, so we just try to get out of there as, as uh, quickly as we, as we could. Anything that's going to pose a hazard to the employees, then we just stop. The crew had only been working on the 200-foot cliffside for less than an hour when the storm began. On a typical day, it could take the crew up to three hours to clear a whole section. When they're able to resume, they'll finish removing rocks from the lower section of the cliff and then stabilize the slope side with wire meshing. This is the, the primary um, part of our work here that we're going to try and clear this all out so we can essentially have a, an open hiking trail here again. And it's going to take a good bit of work and a good bit of time to get this cleared out to be safe for us to open it again. Back at the shop, the crew does paperwork and washes their gear. There's actually a lot of paperwork required with all this stuff, and then also just keeping their gear clean. You can kind of see from my shirt, I'm, I'm filthy from one jump today. And, you know, if I, this is how I look, our gear is even worse. So soapy water helps break it and like lift the dirt um, using a toothbrush too to get in there and then using an air compressor to spray any of the soap and, and the dirt that's in there. And then we have a lubricant too when it's dry to get in there and it uh, prevents rust and corrosion. After the rope access team has made some progress, it's time to start clearing the rocks from the walking paths below. This is where the gorge crew comes in. We take care of about seven trails in total within the gorge itself and then two up top on the top side. Now we are in the process of cleaning the trail and rebuilding it. We've already come down, cleared the loose debris off the trail, and then started staging to get ready for the bigger job ahead. One of those jobs includes a specialized stabilization technique to ensure the slope side is secure. So down here to fix these trails, we use game of baskets. It's a six foot by three foot cube that is made of wire meshing. And what you do is you dig them down, place them within the trail or wherever you need them, and then you add rock to the inside so that the rock weighs it down. Now a job like this can take a week or two, but if we have a good day where we're really rocking and getting stuff done, it can be a maybe a three to four day job. At this mound right here, if all hands are on deck, I'd like to see hopefully by the end of the summer, uh, we get a majority of it taken out and then we have to put in some uh, stabilization techniques to help build the trail back up. So I could definitely see us working into the fall and if I had to make a guess, it'll probably be open next summer. I think if you're gonna do this kind of work, at the core, you have to enjoy working outdoors. You can see special things that people don't see, plants and animals, like the landscape. The work that you do, it's really hard, but then you're helping keep the park safe. 
you make a meaningful difference. If you're just a park user, you might not even realize we were ever there. And that's kind of the point. This is Mac. He specializes in cleaning the homes of people with hoarding disorder and is used to wading through heaping piles of clutter. But this job presents an unusually large challenge. Mac will be cleaning a six bedroom home in Illinois and it's the biggest he's ever tackled. This is just a nightmare. Uh, I mean, we're finding food from 2013. We've got paint cans that I no longer have the strength to carry. Mac often cleans solo and does much of this work free of charge, but this job is so daunting that he's invited two other cleaners to join him. Over the next three days, they'll work together to declutter and clean as many rooms as possible. Normally, uh, I'm dealing with a totally different type of cleaning. In other hoarder houses, I'm dealing with a lot of insects and mouse droppings and pet urine and just a lot of stuff that you definitely want to have PPE on in order to even enter the house. This one was just piles upon piles of stuff. It's the most stuff that I've ever taken out of a house. This house belongs to a family of four who declined to appear on camera due to privacy reasons. One of the family members is believed to be living with hoarding disorder, although he's awaiting an official diagnosis. But even with treatment, experts say relapses can occur. This is the fourth time cleaners have worked extensively to declutter this home. The last attempt was five years ago. Rooms in hoarder houses, we will often find rooms that have never been entered in a decade. And one of the reasons that happens, and it's really common, is you have a room that no longer has a purpose. So in this room, it's the living room and the purpose is to watch TV and to relax. If a room loses that purpose because they start piling things up, then the purpose of the room becomes, this is where we throw all of our stuff. This place is not what I'd consider a hazard or a biohazard. It's a hazard for tripping. And it's a hazard for fire because they've got an open fireplace in here and they've got so much clutter that it becomes a danger. Hoarding is defined as persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions, regardless of their actual value. It's estimated that somewhere between 2 and 4% of the worldwide population have hoarding disorder. It's only day one of this ambitious project, but when Mac and his team arrive at the house, they discover things already aren't going as planned. So they have cleaned a bunch of stuff before we got here, which normally I wouldn't like. I wanted the big mess and I wanted to be able to go through the whole house and make it pretty myself. This is, I think, a 30 yard dumpster. They filled two of these already over the top and we're getting ready to fill the third one. If we had more time, we would probably fill 10 of these from this house. So even though I'm a little disappointed, I'm really thankful that they did have the help. Mac and his team plan to start on what's typically the hardest room to clean, the kitchen. They'll need to pay special attention to this space to ensure it's sanitary enough for handling food. Then they'll move on to the rooms on the main level of the house and finally tackle the basement, which hasn't been entered in three years. The key tools Mac and his team use are an emulsifier to cut through grease, a homemade all-purpose cleaner, scouring pads and razor blade scrapers. So when people asking why this job takes so long, because we had to check everything, like if it's expired or not, or still good, no. Okay, nope, a big no. For the old pancakes, no. Beer, we never waste any beer, no. <laughs> Holy crap, that was a lot. Yeah, that's pushing an easy 200 pounds. <sighs> Max says the biggest challenge of cleaning a house like this is knowing what to keep and what to throw away. There are a lot of people who will say you're fine to throw away absolutely everything, but they don't really mean that. They mean you can throw away the junk, but you have to decipher what's junk and what's not. There's also the urge to throw away large armfuls of stuff 
and most of the time there's going to be some stuff underneath it that's important. All right, I got one counter done. I'm done. Beautiful. Back to the hotel. <laughs> Although cleaning the home will make it safer and more livable, it can be distressing for people with hoarding disorder to see their space transformed. People who hoard tend to have a deep connection with their objects and removing them can create an experience of loss, which is one of the major contributors of hoarding behaviors. He's gonna come home to a very, very dramatic change and it's gonna be a shock to him. And even though most people will come home and see the change and think, oh my God, this is so great, you've cleaned my house, he's probably not gonna feel that way. As day one comes to a close, Mac and the team have finished most of the kitchen, which they will continue to clean for the next two days. On day two, Barbie and Bonnie will also tackle the sunroom and living room, while Mac ventures into the basement. I'm going to go down to that basement and do as much as I can on the basement today. Um, that is going to completely wear me out. If I can get that out of the way today, then that means tomorrow we can do things like the dining room and uh, get this floor done. I'm going to attempt to tackle this area, this whole area. There's this part of the basement. There is a room to my left and there's a room over here and they all look like what's behind me. This is gonna be extremely difficult because there is a lot of things that need to be kept Mac discovers an abundance of stockpiled food and supplies, including countless jugs of water, jars of marinara sauce, bottles of hydrogen peroxide, and five-gallon containers filled with something unusual. All these five-gallon buckets, those are yeah. all filled with food. Yeah, I thought they were pink. What kind of like? Like that one says macaroni and wow. spaghetti or something. So I'm just gonna stack them all together and they wanna but keep But do you them. think it's still good? Probably not. People can inherit characteristics from their parents that make them more likely to develop hoarding behaviors. Grief and loss can also contribute to this. Over the years, Mac has noticed patterns in the kinds of items he finds while cleaning. They stack up air filters and medication and antibiotics and hydrogen peroxide and alcohol, and all of them are unopened. And all of them are there just in case and they just keep building and building. As Mac continues sorting through jugs of water and medical supplies, he stumbles on one item in particular he's learned to never throw away. I've thrown away shells twice, and in both occasions people were like, have you seen a big bag of shells? That was when we went to Myrtle Beach or Florida or whatever on a family trip, but they're never displayed as a collection. They're just stuffed in a bag in some random spot. But I've learned over time that shells are always a memento for somebody unless they got their house infested by clams, in which case they're good to go. Much of what Mac finds in the basement needs to be lugged upstairs to the dumpsters, and so many trips up and down the stairs with heavy bags is starting to take its toll. Right now, my neck is just throbbing and my right arm I'm pretty sure is injured. I have to be super careful today on what I lift and how I lift it and how much I lift. It's a little scary because uh, if I tweak my back anymore, I'm out of the picture, and I don't want that to happen. Back upstairs, Barbie and Bonnie are finishing the kitchen and starting on the living room and the sunroom. We should have time to clean all of this, but priorities. The owner used to sit out in the sunroom every morning and to have, you know, scrambled eggs and toast and coffee, and just, she likes to bead. And I like knowing those details about the owner because it lets us know where emotionally this cleanup is going to affect them in a positive way. As the crew begins to wrap up for the day, the wife of the person suspected to be living with hoarding disorder becomes emotional at the sight of the progress they've made. She was on the second floor of the house looking over the banister and just seeing what Barbie had accomplished. And she wasn't even fully done with the, the room. Uh, she broke down in tears just being able to see the floor again. So if your partner has hoarding disorder, there is a resentment and a frustration and an anger that builds up. And then finally, there's a release point where everything just comes out. And that's what happened there. She's um, very happy to see it opened up. Uh, she's been in the house for 13 years. 
Today's work was way more exhausting than yesterday. It's a different type of cleaning though because it's less, it takes less of your mind to do it, I guess. I'm not really looking at having to sanitize and to get out tiny little stains. I'm just looking to get things out of people's way. And so it takes less mental effort, but man, it takes a lot more physical effort. <laughs> It's the final day of the crew's three-day cleanup, and this is their last chance to organize and declutter as much of the main floor as possible. This is the day where we have to be basically on our game and moving quickly. We're wrapping up the kitchen. We have a dining room, which is just stuff that needs to be moved. Despite the exhaustion Mac is experiencing, he returns to the basement and makes another discovery. God. It's like old rotten garden seeds, and uh, they're not dangerous, but they smell really bad. Garden seeds, when they go bad, smell like raw sewage. You have to breathe through your mouth when you're putting it in. Otherwise, it'll, it'll make you nauseous. You'll be able to see the story unfold as you go through layer after layer of old stuff. The deeper you go into a hoard, that's where you start finding the really rotten stuff and so it always gets worse before it gets better. Excessive acquisition occurs in the vast majority of cases. Oftentimes, these items are on sale and therefore are bought in large amounts. So instead of just getting one, they see the deal and they'll get 20. But there's even in a big house like this, there's not room to put them all. So you've got this giant pile of shop lights and you're probably gonna find that with everything from craft supplies to just random kind of stuff. Night lights. There's an entire rack of night lights. What's really frustrating about this is there's so much stuff that's necessary and has legitimate actual use. That's actually real, really rare for a hoarder house. At the end of day three, the crew has successfully cleaned the kitchen, sunroom, living room, dining room, and basement. And they've removed enough stuff to fill three 30-yard dumpsters to the brim. We're almost done now. Compared to other hoarder houses, it's just me, with three of us working here, in order to get the entire house, every single room, top to bottom clean, we would have needed a crew of probably 10 plus people for at least two weeks. After Mac and his team leave, the family will finish cleaning the remaining rooms. They'll also hire help to maintain the home. I like seeing a house that is so covered up with stuff that whenever you get all of it put away and where it goes and you get everything cleaned up, seeing the house as it was intended to be seen is really a, a cool thing to me. And I think that's part of my, my brain that thinks of rooms like jigsaw puzzles. But what keeps me doing it, I think, is more the stress relief that you see happen on the owner of the house. You can see the stress come off of them at the very end whenever you leave. This one was just exhausting in every measure just because of the sheer amount of stuff. But it's, it's worth it, especially whenever we get to look around the house and say, holy crap, we did that. <laughs> we all did that. Now, we travel to the UK, where Oli Pickles, the owner of iDoctor, shows us how he cleans the dirtiest iPhones. I think the most difficult part of cleaning an iPhone is just knowing that you're touching somebody else's grime and muck. It's disgusting, really, when you think about it. I can already see that we've got quite a lot of gunk in the ear speaker and the speaker grills themselves, so Hopefully there'll be some gunk in there to see and we can give it a real good clean out as well. Lint builds up from inside somebody's pocket and over time when the charging cable's inserted, taken out, reinserted, all that happens is it just compacts into the charge port itself and leaves this sort of mess behind and all this lint. Over time it just compacts, every time you put it on charge it just compacts deep down into the port. When you start noticing 
the ear speaker becomes quiet, the microphone, people can't hear you, or it's not charging correctly, you might have to stand on your head and do a backflip just to make it charge. That's probably when you need to start thinking about cleaning out that charge port or the ear speaker. I'm using this little BGA scraper, which is typically designed for scraping the uh, resin overfill or underfill from logic boards, but it doubles up as a really, really useful tool for cleaning out these charging ports. The stuff what we usually find in the charging ports and crevices of the phone is mostly either pocket gunk or fluff from the bottom of handbags. I mean, I'm not a forensic scientist, but I'm going to guess that it's dog hairs, dust, fluff. I, I don't really know how to describe the, uh, <laughs> the fibers what are in there. Other things that we found in the phone, rice is quite common when phones are become water damaged because they'll stick the phone in rice. That doesn't work, by the way. We did find some weed in one of them and it, it looked like they must have been keeping the stash in the pocket and it the same thing again. There was weed inside the charge port. So this iPhone 7 is coming for a battery replacement and you, as you can see, it's absolutely full of dust, lint, hair, wood chip, feathers, you name it, it's in this phone. Well, I can see that the screen's been replaced before. I think they've probably just never replaced the dust seal what's on there. This is really common because, believe it or not, not many repair places will replace that dust and moisture seal. The best way to clean something like this out is to get all the thick stuff, probably with the dust blower. There is definitely a risk that this dust could cause a short circuit on the on the motherboard. It's going to put lots of strain on peripheral hardware, like the loudspeaker is going to be quiet. The vibration motor is not going to work very well, or you're going to get funny sounds from the vibration motor. A lot of people think that it's just for moisture. It keeps a seal between the screen and the chassis of the phone, which out of the factory is designed so that it's sealed away from elements like dust and dirt. Ear speaker cleaning is one of the things what we get all the time where somebody's phone's really quiet. 10 to 20% of the phones what we get in actually need cleaning out. The easiest way to clean out an iPhone ear speaker is using some isopropyl alcohol. The customer will ask for a sp ear speaker replacing, but in reality, it just needs cleaning out. And even if we did replace the ear speaker, it probably would still be quiet because that mesh is just bunged up and gunked up. Then we loosen up the gunk with a toothbrush. Make sure that it's not the toothbrush that you've used this morning to brush your teeth. And then we play this sound, which plays a 165 hertz sound, which acts as a sort of ultrasonic cleaner. For the most part, I think that the most common thing that gets in ear speaker is probably ear wax. I don't really want to think about what else it could be, what's getting in there because it's, yeah, it's gross. We use two different types of brushes. A, for, for the softer brush, we use a toothbrush. And then a slightly more stiff one is this small horsehair brush. The vibrations act as an agitator and it, it loosens the dirt what's in those tiny little gaps in the ear speaker. So the cloth over the speaker, we add a little bit of alcohol onto there. And the way that that works is just adding a finer layer of cleaning stuff just to get any remaining bits of dust out of there. So for this one, it's an iPhone 11 Pro and it's got a little bit of gunk in the speaker grill at the bottom, which would make the 
found pretty quiet. This is very similar to what gets built up inside the charge port. It's just pocket gunk. The best tool for this one is the sharp pointed BGA scraper again. The debris in these holes will often look like a brownie sort of beige color, whereas the actual speakers are black. So you'll know that you've got it in there. I sort of got involved with fixing friends and family's phones, sorting out technical problems for them. And once I started learning about phone repair, I just got deeper and deeper into it. It's like a rabbit hole and I just got fully sucked down it. We receive about 20 iPhones per week in the post and we probably take in from walking customers between five and 15 phones a day. You get lots of instances where somebody might bring a phone in and it might be a minor thing and they say, oh look, my phone's completely dead. And it's, it's really good to see people very happy once you've repaired their devices. Back in the US, Trey Zipperer shows us how to properly clean forgotten veterans' gravestones covered with moss and algae. So I get a lot of questions about why are these stones so dirty? This is not dirt. These are living organisms. These are plants. The more polished the stone, the less surface area there is for the biological organisms to adhere to the stone. And so the reason why we use this quaternary ammonium compound is this kills them. So these things are natural in nature. You're gonna find in the South, especially, it's not just growing on rooftops, it's also growing on our headstones. My name is Trey Zipperer. I'm the founder of By Memorial Day, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the cleaning of all veteran headstones by Memorial Day in perpetuity. So this is a ground level grave marker issued by the federal government via the National Cemetery Administration. It's a white marble material, natural stone. He was a gunner's mate, GM third class US Navy. I don't think it's respectful to have a veteran's headstone uh, dirty in the least. And so we're gonna clean this uh, headstone of this American hero who gave his all, who sacrificed unimaginable horrors for three and a half years as a prisoner of war. The first thing I like to do is I use a, a, uh, a desk broom to get all of the sand and, and debris off of the stone. So we take our water squirt bottle. Um, I like the one with a little bit bigger base on it. I give it a coating of water. Because again, these, these stones are porous. So it's gonna soak in this clean water, which is not gonna get down in any chemical down inside the stone. We use a cleaning agent that contains an active ingredient known as a quaternary ammonium compound. And it is known and respected throughout historic preservationists as the safest, most effective way to clean natural stone. This brush uh, is made with bristles from uh, Tampico. So the Tampico from the agave plant is a natural bristle that won't harm the natural stone. And then I wanna give it a good coating of the D2 biological solution, which is gonna to go to work on this stone very quickly. You're gonna see this stone starting to turn a bit of an orange color. And then it's gonna continue working on the stone for the next few weeks. And that stone will become brighter and whiter and whiter uh, and you have to clean them about every two to three years. This does a wonderful job of getting all the growth killed on the stone. 
The next step is to let that soak for about 10 minutes. When I'm looking at a headstone in a cemetery, I want that stone to be impeccably clean. It doesn't matter if it's almost clean, it needs to be clean. I think the reason why some veteran headstones become more soiled or more covered in biological growth is because of the polishing of the stone. The more polished the stone, the less surface area there is for the biological organisms to adhere to the stone. And after about 10 minutes, it's not that hard to get the material off the stone with a, a soft bristle, natural bristle brush. then you can get into the etchings with a toothbrush to get into the real nooks and crannies of things sometimes. And the final step of honoring a veteran of our past is to place an American flag at their grave. This is known as a grave flag. This particular grave has already had an American Legion flag holder placed at the grave, and there's a spot in the back of them for the flag stick to just stick right down into it. My vision of by Memorial Day is this one day in the near future, we'll have a volunteer assigned to every veteran's grave in America, no matter where that veteran is buried, no matter what cemetery they're in. So to tell you a little bit about why this happens, these are living organisms, these are plants growing on the stone, whether they're algae or lichens or mold, uh, mildew. And so the reason why we use this quaternary ammonium compound is this kills them. So these things are natural in nature. You're gonna find in the south especially, we have this black mold on all of our, our uh, concrete tile roofs and it's not just growing on rooftops, it's also growing on our headstones. I think it's important that we don't lose the stories of our veteran heroes of the past because they truly are forgotten. Their stories are, are disappearing because when they pass away and the people who knew them pass away, their stories are pretty much gone forever. So now we're uh, gonna start on the etchings. I start with the cross at the top and work my way down just each letter. Uh, these are etched into the marble as compared to the early veteran headstones were bat known as bas relief where the letters were st basically sticking out. They removed the material around the letters so the letters became kind of like three-dimensional. The material that grows inside these stones, it's a combination of things that are fixed in there. And also there's little ledges, so to speak, where when the wind blows, the pollen falls, all different types of things will just get wedged and just build up in these etchings. Grave flags measure eight inches by 12 inches but I would rather have a flag than no flag. So if you can't find an eight by 12, that doesn't mean you can't place a flag at the grave. The person at a podium speaking, for example, the American flag is to their right. So in this case, we have uh, a headstone of American veterans. So as the veteran is looking at you, the flag needs to be to his or her right. You wanna get as close to the stone as you can without marring the stone with your mallet, because when the weed eaters and other types of maintenance equipment comes through, you don't want them hitting your flag holder. The way that I research the veterans buried beneath the veteran headstones that I clean uh, is by using the internet first, and I go to certain sources that I know uh, contain content such as findagrave.com. There's a, several different websites like that, and by looking into those different databases I, and different family trees on ancestry.com, you can start to put together the story of a veteran and every now and then you just get something that's amazing and insightful that you didn't anticipate. 
This is a application for headstone or marker uh, for a uh, deceased American veteran. Uh, the family members would have to complete this application in order to choose what style of veteran headstone that they wanted for their loved one. And this particular application is for Robert uh, S. Lewis, prepared by his father. And this is where the story of his sacrifice uh, became apparent. This man was a sergeant. Sergeant Shadman was a top turret gunner fire in the cockpit. Could not see if he got out. I saw Sergeant Shadman reaching for a parachute. I do not believe he could have gotten out alive because the plane broke apart where he was last seen. When they were attacked, they were flying at 24,000 feet. Sergeant Shadman was up in the top turret. Uh, he was a gunner and he was trying to get out of that top turret as the plane was tumbling to the ground. His death date says September 12th, 1944 but there's evidence to suggest that he did in fact get out of that aircraft and he did reach the ground alive because there's a hospital admission record of him in September, 1944. We don't know what day that he died, but his mother uh, applied for his veteran headstone with a death date of September 23rd. In your local cemeteries, there are local heroes whose graves are in really bad condition and it's pretty sad that a man or a woman gives their life for our country and then they're forgotten in the cemetery and their headstone can't even be read because there's so much biological filth on it. There are people in America who care about veterans' graves. They just don't know what's happening out here. So I wanna bring this story to them so that they know that in your local cemeteries, there are local heroes whose graves are in really bad condition. So if this is something that speaks to your heart I encourage you to get out in your local cemetery, see for yourself if there's veteran headstones in need of cleaning in your local area, and take the initiative to do something about it. This is a rare Persian rug that's appraised at an estimated $12,500, and it's about to get its first cleaning in more than two decades. It's a delicate job, and not just because this antique is so valuable, it's also a family heirloom, and the clients are trusting the team at Rosati Rugs to deep clean it carefully. The goal is to remove the accumulation of dirt and stains without harming the rug's colouring. Ali Rosati inspects the fibres carefully to determine how the rug was originally dyed. This key detail will determine how he'll complete the job without causing any damage, so his clients can continue to pass down this treasure for generations. So my client's aunt had this rug for about 20 years and she was very hesitant to have it clean because she was afraid that it would get ruined. I know this is a 1940s rug because they used vegetable dyes. In comparison to a 1960s tabris like this one here, there's a specific process to cleaning vegetable dye rugs. I know that I can use a deep wash because the dyes won't run. This is the pool that we have the rugs clean and we have a drain right here it's built on an angle so that when we put a rug on either side the water will just go right through directly into the drain one of Ali's team members begins the cleaning process by applying browning treatment to the stains. This works to remove tannin type stains like urine, fruit juice, beer or soil, as well as general discoloration due to age. This 1940s Sheikh Mashayafi rug has collected stains from various family gatherings throughout the years, but that's not all that makes this Tabriz rug unique. What makes it so special is not only the technique of weave and the fine weaving on the back, but also the design and the color combinations that are used as well. After letting the browning treatment sit for 15 minutes, he hoses down the rug and applies shampoo. Next, he agitates the fibers with a scrubber, which loosens up the accumulated dirt and brings it to the surface. So the scrubber or the buffer is used to help scrub and expand the use of the shampoo throughout the rug. And it does it in a fast and efficient way. So if you were to actually hand do this, not only would you get tired physically, but it wouldn't be as effective. Ali estimates that the original weaver made only a few hundred of these rugs decades ago. 
The colouring also dates back to a time when master weavers used different techniques. This rug is made with vegetable dyed wool, which means the colouring came from natural materials like plants, fruits or tree bark. This method is more labour intensive, which adds to the rug's value. Chrome dyes come from chemicals that are used and boiled to create certain colours. Chrome dyes were used to decrease the cost of rug weaving. So in terms of price point, they are less in comparison to rugs that have vegetable dyes incorporated in them. As you can see, this type of a red tone is so bright. You only see that in chrome dyes. But with vegetable dyes, they're a little bit more subtle in comparison. The transition from vegetable dyes to chrome dyes in the mid 20th century brought about a new era in rug making. Chrome dyes offered a wider and more affordable range of hues, which revolutionized the industry. But the legacy of those early Persian rug makers is still visible today in rugs like this, which is why it's so important to preserve it. The team member rinses the rug and pushes a squeegee across each section to remove excess water. He repeats this step several times throughout the cleaning process to remove as much water as possible. He runs the scrubber across the rug again to loosen any remaining dirt and then uses the extractor to lift the stains and remove moisture. The extractor actually has two purposes. You can, one, just use it as a vacuum. You just place it on the rug and you start pulling it towards your direction and it starts extracting the water out so that the rug gets to dry faster. Also, it has another feature where if you press on the lever, not only will it extract water, but it'll expel hot water at the same time. And those are great for taking away stains because you could do that multiple times on a certain area. All of the rugs are heated to a high temperature of, I'd say about 90 degrees on average, and they're hung right here. The rug must be completely dry before moving on to the next step. If not, the excess moisture can lead to mold and mildew, two factors that can deteriorate the fibers in the rug. We'll go inside of the drying room and we'll examine it and touch the pile of the rug, the fringes and the other aspects of the rug to see if it's still moist or not. If we feel it is, we'll keep it in there. The room is dry to a very high temperature and just having all the fans and dehumidifiers, usually having a rug in there for about a day would completely dry it out. The quality of weave on Tabadi's rugs is based on something called raj, which counts the number of linear knots every seven centimeters, which is roughly two and a half inches. The higher the raj, the higher the quality, which also makes a rug more valuable. So in today's market, I would estimate this value around $12,500. You have these lines that are showing on the back side of the rug. And when you look at those lines, you'll be able to actually count how many knots are in between each line and so this specific rug is 50 raj. On a lower quality Tabriz you'll have a 20 raj. This is actually a lower quality Tabriz. You can see how big the knots are in comparison to this rug here. These knots are a lot more tight. This is around that 20 raj that I had mentioned earlier and then you have the 50 raj which is a more higher quality. 60 raj would be very exceptional and then you'll have like 80 or 90 raj which are extremely rare to find and those type of rugs take close to 10 years to make but this type of a caliber i'd say in terms of rarity on a scale of one to ten it would be a seven so when you look at the different color combinations and designs that are used in this rug it seems like there's a lot of religious symbolism going on and that makes sense because sheikh mashaykhi was a religious man within his region. And the predominant use of green is of Islamic religious significance because green was the Prophet Muhammad's favorite color. I've grown up with Persian rugs in my home and there's a lot of deep cultural significance to Persian rugs and the history behind it. So I feel very akin to my culture being in this industry. The rug looks magnificent. It's much brighter than it was before, and the majority of the stains have been removed. There are a lot of other people in this industry that really don't put their heart into it. They just clock in and clock out. But each rug 
is a portion of a person's home. And I take that responsibility to heart, that when they bring their rug to me, they're bringing a part of their home into my life for me to take care of.